Welcome to the South Yorkshire Dermoscopy Academy. I'm Andy and in this video we are going to explore the first three key bits of information you really need to understand and absorb as you embark on your journey to become a dermoscopist. If you make it to the end of this video, as a bonus I will share with you the one question all your patients who present to you with tired all the time really need to be asked, otherwise you're going to miss the underlying diagnosis. Training a primary care dermoscopist for every general practice. Hey Andy, but isn't a dermoscope just an expensive light and magnifying lens? I mean, we have microscopes to look at microbes, otoscopes to look at ears, ophthalmoscopes to look at eyes, and proctoscopes to look at, mmm, isn't that a planet? I didn't say telescopes, did I? I said proctoscope. Ah, uh, I see now it's the planet Uranus. Hey Andy. Could you adjust my AI sensitivity settings, please? So isn't a dermoscope just a version of one of those? Well, Dave, dermoscopes need to be a bit more complicated than that. But you do bring us to our first key point. It needs to be more than just light and magnification. First lenses in antiquity were probably just ornamental. But the first real scientific lens production started in the 13th century. And with refinements, that's how things were for the next 700 years. Let me give a little personal history lesson by way of illustration. I always thought you were older than you looked, Andy. Cheeky. Here's my first magnifying glass. It's a three times lens and served me well for the best part of 15 years when I started out in practice. I then upgraded to a 10 times lens with a more powerful light using this loop, which certainly gives you better magnification and certainly better light. Let's try them out on a mole. Here's our mole. This is Morris. Welcome to the program, Morris. And as you can see, the lens isn't too bad. And with the loop, if you have a little look, it's even better at magnifying what you see. But there's a problem when it comes to skin. Why? It's because the skin bounces the surface light off itself. It refracts it and it prevents a deeper view of the structures beneath, no matter how powerful the magnification used. We need something to see beneath the surface without physically peeling back a patient's skin, which isn't recommended for a variety of reasons. Spoil sport, and that Andy. That brings us to my second point. We have two modes to overcome that light refraction, which complement each other. Our story starts in 1989. The year the Berlin Wall came down between East and West Germany. The Simpsons premiered on Fox TV and perhaps most important from our point of view, one Helmut Hein became worried about a changing mole on his arm. He went to see a dermatologist who had a quick glance at it and said, oh, I don't think it's anything to worry about. Poor old Helmut was stunned and dissatisfied. As a physician and engineer, he went away and started researching the problem in more depth. He learned that more information is stored in the deeper structures of the skin in the epidermis, and this could be seen by using an oil immersion lens and thus enable better diagnosis. The first handheld dermoscope, the Hein Delta 10, was launched the same year in 1989 and revolutionised the assessment of skin lesions. We call this non-polarised light dermoscopy, or NP for short. Studies showed it was a great tool to improve the recognition of skin lesions and confirmation that what you see using a dermoscope does correlate with histology. Consider it working like this. When swimming, you put goggles on and can get a clearer picture of what's underneath the water surface or viewing water through the bottom of a glass bottom boat. The second key advance in dermoscopy, our second mode, occurred in 2001. California medical device manufacturer 3Gen, but now called Dermlight LCC, introduced the first crossed polarised light handheld dermoscope for general sale, the Dermlight DL100. You can still buy them today. This doesn't require direct contact with the skin or an immersion oil or gel interface to work. What's the matter, Dave? You'll be making our viewers' head spin. You need to explain how cross polarisation works. Dave, our viewers don't need to know how cross-polarisation works to use a dermoscope. It's a bit like driving a car. Do you really need to know how the engine works to drive it properly? Since you put it like that, I guess not. So which is the best type of dermoscopy then? Non-polarised or cross-polarised dermoscopy? Well, 
actually, Dave, it's neither. You see, these two modes are complementary to each other because they see at different levels within the skin. Let me show you. Let's label up this cross section of skin showing the different layers. Remember that non-polarized light, you need to use a medium or contact gel to be able to see the structures deeper in the skin. Some people call this wet dermoscopy. This shows the structures from the skin surface to the dermo-epidermal junction most clearly. However, with polarized dermoscopy, you see structures best from the dermo-epidermal junction down to the upper part of the dermis, therefore that little bit deeper. This patient has a dermatofibroma on his right lower leg. We'll be devoting a whole video to these later on. Watch what happens as I switch from polarized to non-polarized light and then back again. These orthogonal white lines or shiny white structures are made up of altered collagen bundles located in the dermis and thus are best seen on polarized dermoscopy and are almost invisible on the non-polarized light setting, which can only see higher up in the epidermis. Look at this typical Stockholm seborrheic keratosis on this patient's abdomen. Note what happens when I switch between the modes now. The white dots made of balls of keratin are much brighter and better seen using the non-polarized setting because they are located higher up in the epidermis. Why aren't all dermoscopes hybrid dermoscopes then? I want one of those. For the simple reason, Dave, it's more complex to include both modes in a dermoscope, so they cost a lot more money. I'll be giving advice on the questions to ask before you purchase a dermoscope in another video. But remember, when someone shows you a dermoscopic picture of a skin lesion, you should really ask if it's polarized or non-polarized so you can interpret what you see better. Andy, can you use a contact medium with cross-polarizing dermoscopy? Sure you can. If your dermoscope has a faceplate like this one, because some polarized dermoscopes don't. Using gel as a contact medium provides an even clearer picture when using polarized settings. In summary, the different modes of dermoscopy you can use are in this grid here. We also tend to shorten cross-polarization dermoscopy to polarized dermoscopy for simplicity's sake. And the final key fact you really need to know is that actually you're gonna to have to learn three different styles of dermoscopy because the structure of the skin varies around the body. The palms and soles of your feet and nails don't have any hair follicles. They have a lot more sweat glands. The scalp has obviously a lot more hair follicles, but then so does the face. And also the epidermis and stratum corneum is much thinner. But therefore, when you move the dermoscope around the body, you're going to have to think about the underlying structures in order to interpret what you see dermoscopy. Training a primary care dermoscopist for every general practice. Congratulations for making it to the end of this video. As promised, here's the bonus. What do you think that key question you must ask all your patients who present with tired all the time is? Well, it's this. When you wake in the morning, do you feel refreshed? A good follow-up question is, do you snore? And often ask about what other people tell the patient about their snoring. Why is this important? It's because Obstructive sleep apnea is easy to miss in patients presenting with tiredness all the time. It's estimated one and a half million adults in the UK have it, and 85% are undiagnosed, and some of those are gonna be your tired all the time patients. If you suspect obstructive sleep apnea, and then do the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, link below, and if the patient scores highly, then you can refer them on to the sleep center locally usually under respiratory departments, and help transform that patient's life. Oh, and if any patients happen to be listening to this and think, I've got it, then you can read more about the condition via a link below. Do the Epworth questionnaire yourself, and if you score highly, and I hesitate to say this, book a GP appointment to ask them to consider a referral for you. Please don't go and say to your GP, I saw it on YouTube, or I was looking on the internet, but just say this, doctor, I'm worried I may have sleep apnea. For these reasons, what do you think? So, there's one more thing I think I really should do. I should take these and I should retire them to a place on my shelf behind me. I will do it just like, and there they shall remain, because I now use a dermoscope. Training a primary care dermoscopist for every general practice.